I'm really thankful to Dr. Soham for coming forward the very, very last minute to talk on uh, acute high drops and which Sheetal had to talk. And he's going to deal with surgical management options for acute high drops. On to you. Uh, good evening, everyone, once again. So this is just something which has, was ready. I have not prepared for it, actually. Just let's go over it very quickly on... Uh, surgical managements of uh, high drops. I have no financial interest in this talk. So are the slides visible? Just to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So acute high drops, as we know, it's not an uncommon complication of any of the ectatic disorders, be it keratoconus, keratoglobus, or even pellucids. It is also rarely seen in post lasic ectasia cases. The common presentation is uh, sudden impaired vision with some amount of pain and the eye appearing white. So usually we do the conservative management where the healing takes place in two stages. There is reattachment of the DM followed by endothelial migrations. And there is spontaneous resolution seen after eight to 12 weeks. And the commonly applied medications are usually a soft steroid, some cycloplegia, anti-glaucoma medications, hypertonic saline and lubricants. However, there is no defined standardization of this therapy. So why go for surgical management when conservative management gives us a spontaneous resolution? So usually the idea is to avoid scarring. So it can either be a central or paracentral scarring. Sometimes there is a lot of neovascularization. Some of these scarrings may improve with a, a contact lens later on, but a central scar usually requires a corneal transplant. So doing an, an acute management is to avoid potentially a transplant later on. The clinical examinations that we need to do is, number one, look for any fluid clefts and DM break if seen. And in the rare cases, sometimes there might be a coexisting perforation also, especially in the post lasic cases. The investigations, the anterior segment OCT is the most useful thing here. Previously, UBM was there, but now we have such beautiful OCTs. So that's the go-to test. It locates, we can locate fluid clefts, any desmet detachments and also, we can serially, if we do, we can have, you can see how the stroma scars as the high drop slowly resolves. Shine fluke imaging of the other eye to detect any unknown, uh, if not previously known, ectaceous. And in for research purpose, we have the role of in vivo confocal microscopy. Now, surgical management, there's a long list of surgeries. You can do either a fluid drainage only, especially if we have access to an intraoperative OCT. You can supplement it with uh, intracameral gas, commonly C3 F8 or also SF6, and then add on compression sutures also. So usually we do a combination of these procedures. And later on in scarred stages, there is the option of doing transplant, either a DALC or a PK. And there are some newer reports of doing an EK as a patch graft to seal the DM break. Rarer managements are like thermokeratoplasty and recently described is the platelet-rich plasma injection in the AC. Mm -hmm. So gas tamponade, how it works is basically it brings about the it brings the desmets closer to the stroma. Commonly, we use a 14% 3CF8 or SF6, which allows for a longer tamponade. Thus, the patient has to be maintained in a supine position for the next at least a week. And between the two gases, there is no difference in the final visual or transplant outcomes. Compression sutures now, various suturing techniques have been uh, described. So one, you can do like a full thickness suture close to the break and sort of bring the separated edges of the DM together. Or we can have these overlay sutures, which are partial thickness and the sutures are actually passing in the peripheral cornea. So you avoid the suture bite marks in the central cornea, which also adds to some amount of scarring. The overlay sutures are ideally given perpendicular to the DM break if you can locate it either preoperatively or intraoperatively. And then there is the venting incision. So it can be guided by IOCT, pre-op, ASOCT or UBM. And uh, some surgeons have described identifying this using intracameral tripe and blue if, if the fluid clips can be identified. So this is just uh, an example of how the venting incision looks like. I have already filled the chamber with C3F8 and from the ASOCT, I know where the fluid clips are. This is 30 gauge needle going in and you can see that there is egress of fluid once that 
focal area is ruptured. Here is the second area. And now, once this fluid has drained, now you can make out where the DM break is. It's in this sort of diagonal direction. Here it is more prominently visible. So now we know where to put the suture in which direction. So combined procedures is actually the uh, preferred case. If you're doing at all doing a surgical intervention in acute hydros, that's the preferred technique now. So there is good outcome in terms of both safety and efficacy and reported by multiple publications globally. So short video on that. This is actually slightly older lady for developing acute high drops, 39 year old. So already in the slit lamp examination, you can see this vertical area of fluid clefts and also in the slit section. And once you do the anterior segment OCT, you can see this is there's a large area of fluid cleft and probably in the, that area of red arrow that's where the dm break is because the irregularities are noted over there there is no sharp hyperreflective line seen in that area so this is the on table so initially i went ahead and did the fluid drainage using a 30 gauge needle followed by very careful paracentesis. The main care here is to avoid any lens touch. So this is the overlay sutures. You take partial bite depths like a horizontal mattress basically. So once these are passed, then you tie them real tightly. But the advantage is there is no suture bites in the central cornea take two or three such compression sutures so that the entire length of the break is well covered. So the gas bubble is sort of pushing the DM up from the inner surface, whereas the sutures are compressing this edematostroma from the outer aspect. So you have a flattening effect from both the side, which leads to faster resolution of the stromal edema and eventually lesser scarring. So at the end, Put a BCL on and of course ensure supine position. We can burp out some amount of air after maybe a couple of hours in the slit lamp. So this is at post of seven days. You can see there is and this is finally at one month. The edema is almost well resolved. There are some suture lines. This is epithelial scarring. It will go off eventually. And in retroillumination, you can make out where the decimate break is. It's a fusiform break right there. And once we do the anterior segment OCT, you can see that there is scarring at the decimate level and probably endothelial migration is already taking place. So complications are ured zavalia syndrome, pupillary block, glaucoma, and sometimes even malignant glaucoma. And of course, there is a higher percentage of developing a complicated cataract. So now the newer recommendation as described by uh, Sunita Madam's group is doing a partial air fill. And this also gives a quite fast resolution. This is just showing immediate results. So this is at two hours and five hours. You can already see that even with a 50% C3F8 gas, the edema is resolving so fast. And finally, uh, if all there is significant scarring, you have to do a transplant. So the main thing here is big bubble technique to be avoided. Better to go for a manual dull. And PK after high drops, definitely the visual outcome is good, but it is associated with higher rates of rejection. Possibly due to the vascularization which takes place in uh, once the high drops resolves. And nowadays, there is this concept of doing a small DSEC or a DMEC patch graft over the break in the high drops. So this can sort of resolve the edema as quickly as possible. So finally, uh, for management of acute high drops, a good slit lamp evaluation and anterior segment OCT is the most important tool here. The surgery of choice is doing a compression suture with partial intracameral uh, gas. And full, full air chamber nowadays to be avoided. And outcomes are usually good with contact lens fitting unless there is a dense central scarring. 
and eventually they can be if the visual outcome is not satisfactory they can be taken up for a transplant later on thank you very much thank you you couldn't have done better even had you prepared i, know. I, I wanted to say this one thing chitra we must congratulate you so much because you five you left nothing before the program started he yeah. i told him yeah, right? you left he left nothing actually it's it's a very complete talk yeah thank you ma'am thank you ma'am uh, dr basant dr basant just... is there with us he's not there uh, i just want one question uh, like um, whom do i ask ियलीफ्टेबल Uh, second thing is the UVM resolving index. We have described the high drops uh, resolving index in UVM. Again, that helps you to monitor the case, and this is published in ophthalmology. So I think uh, these are the two things which are important. Uh, Doctor Nikhil, I wanted to ask you one very simple question. Uh, there is uh, there are some who think of giving repeat gas injections too. So if if you feel so, what should be the ideal time interval between the first and the second? How how soon should you do it, and how long would you wait for the edema to resolve? I don't think I am the best person to answer this, but I think in general, if you put C three F eight, you know, it stays pretty long inside. So I am not sure whether. Preeta, uh, you want to come in? You've done a lot of work on this yeah. thing. Uh, what are your opinion about the and your technique? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, personally, I don't favor uh, gas at all. I don't use any gas. I just use only air. at the time of surgery just to get a plane at which where your desmids membrane breach is quite often you're able to localize and if you use a light pipe you can always see that sometimes and technique is again partial thickness and just avoiding the center visual axis so for like let us say breach in the center so i go from periphery to center in keratoconus like let us say there's a breach in the center so it's an arcuate fashion and then the center part would be more like an infinity figure of eight suture just to avoid any suture passage into the visual axis and then this suture because it is partial thickness now the compression suture is conventionally is reported to be like we have to take it full thickness through the desmids membrane but that in a way tends to cause scarring a lot more than what is what should be so partial thickness does not cause so much of suturing uh, so much of scarring and then these sutures while well, like uh, as what dr namrata said uh, on table itself when you are passing the suture by you see a lot of edema is already subsided on table so basically you are compressing to bring it closer to the posterior membrane and you see a lot of resolution right on table itself so that's the usual technique i follow i don't put any uh, gas uh, rather i'll just put a very tiny air bubble one like uh, because i i feel like that that has a potential to cause urethralia secondary glaucoma all such things so i i never use uh, intracameral c3 f8 or sf6 it's only 100% air that's really nice uh, however having said that i would say that uh, no. there is no absolute thing in science there are different ways of handling many uh, uh, thing uh, proper uh, care of uh, making sure that the free gas bubble in the interior chamber without uh, uh, pupillary block uh, has been used by many of us for a very long time and it does work uh, along with that compression suture and as sunita was saying so interestingly we, we have so many different techniques whatever works in one hand and uh, even if one doesn't work we have something else to fall back on uh imanchu i have just one question please uh, we see a lot of down syndrome patients with uh, high drops you know so is there any because for them anything to do would require anesthesia they are not cooperative and things like that so what is the recommendation i, th- I think in institutes maybe it's easier to give anesthesia but in small centers so do you follow the same guidelines or you have any different approach? so uh, down I, i think sunita you want to take up you see a lot of such kind of uh, children downs have to be sunita can and dr yes, namrata sunita. yeah both yeah, of you yes sunita first you answer then i'll answer yeah yeah it's the same strategy again uh, down syndrome i'll be very cautious about using any sort of long acting gases because uh any you know they they are very prone for sometimes expansion of the gases so it will be again air same technique 
yes suture removal would be one of the things which may be if it's a large one then certainly yes uh, they will require uh, compression sutures if it is a smaller one i'll just prefer to go for a conservative management because generally like uh, less than five four five millimeters you don't really need to do anything they just with a conservative management approach also they do well unless it's a bigger one where the child becomes you know restless because vision is compromised and they become agitated so then would be the reason to perform compression sutures in those eyes and then suture removal anesthesia will be required is venting so, in i think uh, we do it differently we i would do all cases under general anesthesia and with uh, sf6 uh, not with S sometimes with sf6 and most of the times with the c3f8 gas only thing is that at the end of the procedure you burp it so that only the two thirds fill up and not the whole chamber these venting incision are they commonly done or very uncommon and how do you avoid epithelial ingrowth do they happen if there are clefts which has in as now with all these things with the yeah. changing uh, diagnostic procedures like asoct commonly yeah. available in our hand there are many things which has changed and one of them is venting incision so when we see large clefts and all those things earlier we didn't see them so often so now we see them we drain it out and if we do not drain it out the resolution is very very slow and sometimes the uh, there can be potential of uh, having a uh, uh, fistula kind of thing formation so of course they do help uh, when we combine everything together i think uh, one of the first publication yeah. was by proful is here proful had uh, written yeah. this paper on intrastromal yeah, proful drainage. is here so proful had written this and dr vaj it was dr vajpayee's idea which we you know published uh, but at that time we didn't have intra opacity so yes. we wrote it as as oct guided uh, Praful, can you just publish in both era pre yeah. MIOCT as well as during MIOCT? Yeah. And at RP center, we still follow that technique. Uh, we don't uh, use this um, compression suture at all, and we have yeah. excellent outcome with this intrastomal drainage. Yes, Even yeah. with the of ASOCT, also you can localize the area of cleft and you can do it. Okay, that is the paper that we initially published. The results are as good as uh, any other technique. And putting compression suture may be good enough for routine cases, but uh, when you are dealing with Down's baby, and even the anesthetist is not willing to take up for the first surgery, then again taking the patient for another surgery, uh, putting under risk of GA, uh, I don't think that uh, suits us. So what we do is we do this uh, intrastomal drainage, and uh, as ma'am said, uh, Dr. Sunita also said that usually we use air only. If you are 100% sure that all the clips have been drained and there are no chance of any fluid uh, collection, then we leave it with air only. But as ma'am said, if there are little possibility, because most of the time you, you may not be able to drain each and every clip or you are not sure about that, then those cases maybe SF6 is a good idea. Yeah. 